We're recording, man. Perfect. We've recorded all of this. Good. Perfect. All the mean things said about old people. That's fine. I mean, in high school, I've seen, I mean, I've seen the way that God moves through people, through my friends. I've seen, um, the, the biggest one I think that I can think of is like, we, as an ECS family, we went through a tough season losing an ECS parent and an ECS student a couple years back. And I saw God move through his people. Like I got to see how his people come alongside each other and love on each other through times of grief. And I got to see how not only like people who know this, knew these families, knew these people, but they just knew that this family needed love and they needed love that only God could give. And I got to see people share the love of God through scripture, through prayer, through bringing people meals, through all these different types of things. And that was, that's probably like the most notable, like biggest way in like my high school career that I saw God move. Um, I mean, other things of like, I've seen him reveal things to me, like reveal pathways towards what he's called me to do and reveal those types of things through people that he's put in my lives, through scripture that he has revealed to me through like studies I've done through his word. And so like, those are probably the two biggest things that I've seen. Um, one of the biggest ways I can think of is just some struggles I've had personally uh, and just seeing this wonderful community just coming alongside me and bolstering me in my faith, uh, uh, mental health, and just things like that. They've really shown me what true love looks like uh, whenever I oftentimes felt like I couldn't find it. I think just um, when I was having like doubts or when I was like maybe not as strong, just you know showing up to help me understand that yes, he does love me and he's always there for me. I, I just say either through working like and volunteering at church, I saw him move a lot just by um, helping lead worship and becoming a major part of the volunteering team here. Um, another way is to show choir because that's like the only other thing I do ever. So um, I was able to see him a lot through that, especially becoming part of the leadership team there and just trying to be the best and kindest version of myself and just show everyone Jesus whenever I was there. So. What what do you call a pig that's really good at karate? A pork chop. Very nice. Okay. All right. Hey, what is up, everyone? How are y'all doing tonight? <laughs> hey, well, uh, we are so excited that y'all are here tonight. Um, and if you are a little disheartened by the rain or school's getting hard, hey, school's almost over, so there's a way to find new joy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hey. So uh, if you are new here tonight by chance, or if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Tyler Webb, and I am the Associate Youth Director here on staff. And I am so excited that y'all decided to come join us on this nasty, rainy day. So uh, two things before we kind of uh, get started tonight. Uh, one is I'm kind of working over a cold, so I'm sorry if my voice is a little gone or if uh, I had to drink a lot of water so I don't have a complete coughing fit up here, so just a forewarning. Uh, but then secondly, if y'all are okay with it, and if y'all kind of bear with me, I'd love to kind of do like a little mini kind of a social experiment. Are y'all okay with that? Yeah, sweet. I love it. I love it. So real quick, uh, I'm going to head off stage for a second, but while I'm gone, just try to be quiet. I'm going to uh, take care of something, but just be quiet while I'm gone, okay? Y'all should be good. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Okay, so that was, I know I'm back. So that was a planned 45 seconds of silence. Who thought that like just lasted forever and it was super weird? Few people, yeah. Now, complete honesty, 
who else in that kind of time of waiting kind of turned to the person next to them because they didn't know how to handle that silence and started talking? It's okay. That's totally fine. There's no problem with that. Who also, complete honesty again, in that kind of time of silence, also got out your phone and kind of like tried to entertain yourself because you didn't know what to do in that silence and waiting? Anybody get their phones out? A few? Okay. That's perfectly fine. Look, you're in good company. Everyone in here has a problem with waiting. No matter like how you like shake it down, like it's the way we're wired. We're just so wired to do, to make, and to create, like just to do things. And so if we have this time where we sit in silence, it just feels kind of off. But it's not just like the way we were created too. It's also the kind of world we live in. The world we live in urges us to go or get it now or why wait? There's no time for that. You have to keep going, going, going. And so in this world, it's so hard to slow down because they teach us that you should get what you want and you should get it now. There should be no time to wait. You should keep going, going, going. But you should also feel just a little bit better because you're not the only one in this crowd of people who find it hard to wait. You see, in, uh, in 1972, Stanford did this uh, kind of social experiment as well, but with a way younger age of children to see that if they could wait or to see if they struggled with that idea of waiting. And so the experiment they did, I don't know if you've seen YouTube videos or watched it in any kind of psych class, but what they do is they would uh, bring a, a, a kid in, they put like a marshmallow in front of them, they said, hey, if you wait for me to come back, I will give you like two marshmallows. But if you eat it while I'm gone, you don't get anything else. And so some would leave, some would immediately eat it, some would have to fight through the temptation or put their head down. But basically the result all showed that we all struggle with this idea that instead of waiting for a better option, which will come, we immediately try to take the first option out of waiting because it's just so hard to do. We want this kind of instant gratification and we want it now. And so through that, uh, this (laughs) it's unfortunate, but all of that anxiety or frustration from waiting comes from us living in a fallen world. And what that looks like and how it kind of plays out in your spiritual life and is mine as well, is sometimes when you're praying or you're crying out to God and you're asking for all these good things, you're asking for patience, for, for courage or for strength to get through something or all these good things, sometimes all you're met with is silence. And that's not at all what we want. When we pray to God, we usually expect it to happen now or very near to us because we just hate waiting for all of his good gifts that he wants to freely give us. And unfortunately, it doesn't help that in this life, you're going to see wicked people get all the things that you think you deserve or they're going to succeed where they don't even have a relationship with God. While you're over here waiting for all these good things to happen, they're over here not like in a relationship with God and they're instantly getting everything that they want. And unfortunately, this shouldn't shock you, but they're gonna get popularity, fame, and influence. They're gonna get all these things that you may want, but that shouldn't be where our final desire is. That's not where we find fulfillment at. You see, in the silence or waiting or whatever obstacle or trial you're going through, we begin to see that God is seeing our faith being tested and he's seeing the faith that is developed through it and that he wants us to put our full reliance on him. That is how we survive the wait is we put all of our trust and all of our care in him to survive this time of waiting. Now the sermon, I'm not trying to say that God is silent all the time. That's completely opposite of what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that when you do find yourself in these long seasons of wait, where it feels like God is completely silent in your life, the faith you're going to build to endure that time of waiting is how your legacy is going to be described by. Your legacy of your enduring faith is what you're going to be known by. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. Because in this series, we are focused on leaving behind a godly legacy, and it takes a strong faith to actively get through seasons of waiting to build up your legacy. All that comes together in every season, whether it's times where your life seems super loud or it's other times where your life is super quiet and there's not going on. All that adds together to make your legacy. All those times where you have to make the decisions in time of waiting or all these things come together and add up. But tonight, or even just in your life in general, you have the decision before you to trust in your heaven father to, to give you every good thing and to wait on him, or you yourself can try to fill that void where you think he's just missing in your life with whatever destructive sin habit you might find yourself easily drawn to. You can choose of whether you want to immediately rush into a bad decision or you're actually gonna stay strong and endure the wait and rest in him and wait on him to give you what he wants to fully bless you with. 
But you don't just have to take my word for it. We see that play out in scripture too. And as we move into this next chapter of Joseph's life, we're gonna see that he, how he handles the weight as well. Because so far we've covered in the beginning all of his family and all the drama that came with it. And then last week we moved on to where his, his time in Egypt and we saw his integrity be tested and put on the line. And tonight we're gonna look at where he is in jail for a crime he didn't even commit. So real quick, if you have your Bibles with you and want to follow along, or if you have the Bible app and want to follow along, we're going to be primarily in Genesis 40, uh, but also the verses will show up on the text uh, on the screen. So if that is how you want to watch and play, follow along, that is definitely okay too. Um, so real quick, before we dive into the text, I'm going to pray us into the message and then we'll uh, move right along. So if you'll bow with me real quick. Father, I humbly come for you now. Lord, speak for your servant is listening. God, I pray that you'll open the hearts and the minds of everyone in here, God, including me. Father, that you will communicate exactly what you want for everyone to hear. Jesus, use me however you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, if you were here last week, you saw what Jeremiah talked about, uh, Joshua. Joseph, so sorry. I've been confused this so many times. So, Joseph... Um, avoided uh, Potiphar's wife's advances, and he even fled temptation, and yet he still ended up in jail for something he didn't even do. And so we see that in jail right now where he's at, um, he is alone, not like where he used to be, not in the neighborhood he used to be, not serving the people except for Potiphar still, but everything is totally different. But God was still taking care of him, and God was still faithful to him. He see that uh, Potiphar trusted Joseph's character even through what happened, and he still j uh, chose to uh, reward him and put him over things, over tasks, over people, and he was still over things and taken care of. So starting in verse 1, follow along with me as we kind of dive in the text. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief, cup, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody, and one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation." When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not all interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. So we see in the beginning that Joseph had been in prison for some time now. He had been alone. He had been secluded. He was still taking care of things, but yet all the same, he was in prison. His life had been totally turned upside down last week. But this is where the story really takes off because we see that one morning he wakes up and he goes over to the cupbearer and the baker and he sees that they are a little distraught and he tells them that they, uh, they tell him that they had dreams last night, dreams significant enough to still leave a lasting impact the morning, the next morning. And so this is kind of the first thing I want to point out in the text is that Joseph sees them and he cares for him. Now, Joseph's in waiting too. He's waiting for God to move and to act. He's in prison wrongfully and he's waiting on God. And yet in that time of waiting, he's still trying to take care of the people around him. You see, sometimes in your waiting, it can be very easy to become bitter or angry at God for his timing. And, to be, and you start to even take it out on the people around you because you're just so frustrated and you don't know what to do with it. But Joseph serves an example that while you're waiting on God through your prayers, that you still need to be present of where God has you at. God has you there for a reason and on purpose. Look for the people around you and still care for them. And follow God even when you don't feel him because you know what he has taught you, you know it to be true. Still stick to that and believe in that even when he feels silent. So Joseph comes over and asks why the sadness. And they tell him that it's because of the dreams they had and that no one's there to interpret them. And this leads to the second point from the text I want to point out here is that Joseph tells them that don't all interpretations belong to God. Now, what's so significant about this is that for some of us in here who may be in a season of waiting, it can be really hard to say that so confidently that all good things belong to God because you could feel like you're just abandoned by God. You could be in here right now and you feel like you're just in this prison of your own sin and you're just waiting for rescue. You're waiting for God to move and to act but in that waiting, you cannot forget that God is present. 
it's hard to say all the times that God is good when you feel like you've been abandoned by him. Or it feels hard to say that, oh yeah, all good things, all truth, all knowledge belong to God. But at the same time, he has yet to give me any of that. So why should I believe and say that so confidently? And that's the thing I want to point out here is that I would encourage you when you're in that same time of distress or when you feel like you're completely abandoned or you feel like you're in the prison of your own sin, when you feel like you just want to cry out to God, that you should turn to the Psalms during those times. Because David, I promise, has been through the same exact things you've been through. And while it can be easy sometimes for us to just kind of Chart, uh, just kind of say that David's just complaining. Every time David says in this long, elaborate psalm, he's just complaining, but that's not what David's doing. You see, David is practicing a healthy kind of way of uh, taking his burdens and giving them to God called lament. Everyone say lament. So what lamenting is, is that it's that time where you, you take all of your, your emotions, your situations, and basically just what's going on in your life, and you give it to God. And now what makes this difference different than complaining is that through this process, you become closer to God. All that, every time you take your burden, every time you take your stress or your life of what's going on in you to God, it should leave you from a different state because you're fully giving all of your cares, anxiety, and through this weight, you're giving it to him. And so in those same Psalms, there's times where David might start out with, oh, how long, oh Lord, will you abandon me? Oh God, why are the enemies around me triumphing? Oh, why are they asking me, where is your God? Why isn't he rescuing you? Those same Psalms that start out that way, through David expressing and getting off his emotions out, they usually will all end the same of where David says, God, but I am satisfied in you. I find rest in you. I know you to be good and right and all things are according to your will. That is the process of what lament looks like is where you are expressing everything that's a burden in your life, but you're actually giving it to God and you're actually letting him take care of that. And so in those same Psalms, by the end of it, you should be remembering God's goodness. It should be a refreshing feeling. So in Seasons of Wait, express the depths of your heart to God, but then also look back and remember times in your life where you saw him move and was active in your life and let that lead you through temptation. Let that lead you through any weight of where the last time you saw God move, let that be the greatest thing ever that carries you until the next time you see God move or the next time you see him act in your life. Don't act like just because you're in a season of wait or silence that God's not there. No, he's right beside you, but you have to let that sink down in your head and in your heart that God has never left you for one second. God has never abandoned you. It's just right now you're in a season of wait. So Joseph goes on to use his God-given interpretation to speak to the two different dreams of the cupbearer and the baker, baker there, and one being favorable and one being not so much. And so the favorable one, this is what he ends up saying uh, and asking him for when he goes back to being in Pharaoh's court. He says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention to Pharaoh and so to get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here I also have done nothing that they should put me into the pit." But then look what happens next in a few verses later when uh, the cupbearer is actually back in Pharaoh's court. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Again, when you're in the season of waiting, it's not like your good deeds are going to rescue you or pull you out of it. There's nothing that you can kind of add up all your good deeds and kind of cash them in like a spiritual paycheck to God. That's not what gets you out of the waiting. What builds us up and sustains us through that time of waiting is is your faith and your dependence on God, it get, will get you through any darkness or any trial you come before. We believe, you should believe the same way as when you do feel his presence and the same way when you don't feel his presence. God doesn't change, but sometimes your faith can waver, but you choose to stay strong in him and endure. And, if you, and in the next chapter, immediately goes on to say that it was two years later when the next time that Joseph's story really starts. So we really never know when God's going to answer our prayers, but we should still stay strong and believe in him. It could be weeks, days, months, or even years, but it's, your, it's on you to stay faithful and stay dependent on God because he has never been not faithful to you. And trust me, I'm not speaking to someone who has never experienced a way or never experienced any time of season of hardship. This is the biggest part of my testimony. You see, when I was in high school, I graduated uh, when I was 18. And from there, I went and followed uh, through youth ministry and through uh, discipleship and through praying. I just had to accept the call into ministry and follow God to uh, Harding, Arkansas, uh, or Searcy, Arkansas, to go to Harding University, where I was going to be a Bible major and I was going to major in youth ministry. And that's what I truly wanted. That's what I moved into. 
But it was about a year and a half later where I was uh, really good at being social and making friends, but I wasn't so good at the academic part, so I unfortunately had to move back home with my parents. And at that time in my life, it hit me hard because I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was following the call. I thought I was taking a step in faith. I thought I was just trusting fully on God. And when, it, when I had to leave and come back home, when I had to abandon everything that I, I truly thought I was being called to, I became angry and bitter. And I decided that, you know what? This whole calling is just garbage because it's not working out for me. It's not what I wanted. I learned really quick in that season that I based a lot of things on what I wanted and not actually following God or trusting in his good plan. And so then a few years later, I am in this routine of where I'm just going to school, going to uh, eat lunch, uh, going to a part-time job, and then coming back home. And I'm just doing the same thing over and over again because I fully have given up. I just did not care anymore. And so fast forward, uh, so I transferred to a junior college, and then I transferred to my third college, and I finished up at UTC. And it was luckily by the grace of God at UTC where I was able to find a student ministry, able to find a small group that I've really plugged into, and I found a mentor in my small group leader. And it was through that mentor, through the student ministry, that really God used to revive my faith. And in that, I found a very much deeper so relationship with him. And I found that no matter what, his plan was what I wasn't following. I was kind of set up in my own mind where I was like, oh no, I'm doing what God wants. I'm, I'm out here, I'm taking a step in faith. But all of it was kind of subtly like, look at me, I'm doing these things. I'm out here, I'm doing that. And I wasn't ever actually caring for God's plan. And so by the time I finally got hired here at Crossroads, I was 28. So it took me 10 years to finally ever land in a church. And while I love my time here and it's been such a blessing, that's not the reward that I'm talking about that God will give you if you survive the wait. The reward is a deeper, more depending faith on him. That's what gets you through this life. The reward is not always what you pray for or what you want. It's the faith that's developed through the process that's really worthwhile and better than anything you could ever imagine. But now, look, I get it. There's not, there's, I'm not saying that you're not ever going to f- have a temptation or have that kind of idea in your head to, oh, God's taking too long. I need to jump out. But no, but through that, what I've learned is that those temptations will come, but I know God's plan to be far better than anything I could personally come up with. And I know to trust that now more than anything. And one of the things that I had to realize that I want to kind of share with you and hope you can start to realize in your own life is that your legacy is shaped by the endurance of your faith in God. That's always going to be the case. How your faith endures from where you're at now in high school to when you move into college and when you move into the adult world, that's what shapes your legacy is how you choose to endure with whatever life throws at you. When you see that this world is broken, you see that it's fallen, but you know you serve the God of the universe, that's better than anything you could ever imagine. And, begin, and trust me, I get it. I'm speaking like this is not some easy at all. I've, I've tried, I failed, and I had to come back. And I realized at the end of the day, God is greater than anything I could have ever followed or pursued in my own life. And I'm telling you that here with every fiber of my being because it took 10 years to learn that lesson, but now it's so rooted in my heart that I'm not gonna forget it. That's what means the most to me in this life. And that's what I wanna help you to understand. And so here in a second, I wanna tell you just a few things that I learned in my life through those 10 years that I wanna share with you, but also we see it reflected in scripture. And the first one here is that God prepares you for the wait. And what I mean by that is that everything you're doing in church, everything you're learning in youth, everything you're learning in your small group, from your small group leader, everything you're learning from the people pouring into you or, or even uh, in your own personal time of reading the word and prayer, everything you're doing in that process is preparing you for whatever stage you have next in your life. God is constantly molding you through whatever you go through to prepare you for this next stage. It may not always seem like it. You may not understand kind of the route or the direction at, at every time. But that's the case. Your life was meant to be a continuous growth in your faith. It's never in your faith. It's never meant to be just like stagnant or stop. You're con- you're continuing to grow. Even now at my stage at 28, and even when I'm like down the road at like 48, I'm still going to be learning. I'm still going to be growing. And then even when I'm 68, it's still a process. You're still learning more and more about God. God is molding you through everything, and He wants to walk with you each step of the way. And Joseph's faith is what also helped him through his time of being there. Your constant obedience is in your everyday life is what's going to prepare you to face whatever God has next for you or prepared you for. Stay obedient, stay faithful, and endure. 
And the next thing I uh, want to point out is that God is with you in the wait. Now, it may not seem like it in the midst of everything you're going through or every season of wait you may face, but I promise God has never left your side. When you look back after you're on the other side of this waiting period, you'll realize that God was never abandoning you. He is faithful. He will always show up for you. He's always there. And for Joseph, it was rewarding his faithfulness and and that his waiting was not as bad as it could have been. When Joseph was in jail waiting on God to rescue him or to pull him out of jail, God rewarded his faithfulness by making the jail like kind of period not as bad as it could have been. Joseph was uh, under offense of committing adultery with this man's wife and yet he was not put to death because Potiphar trusted his character. God rewarded his faithfulness and made his time of waiting that much better. Joseph knew God was with him even in the prison, even when his situation wasn't great at all. He never left him or abandoned him. It's the same way for us. Keep running to him and remind yourself of all the good times that you've seen God act in your life. Remind yourself that to get through any temptation you may face on this side of glory and rely fully on him because he is always there for you. He wants you to put your whole dependence on him. And if you are in this uh, a period of waiting or if you're in a time or season of your life where you feel like God is just, wait, uh, there's this waiting period, then actually just sit actively in that period. Don't try to like rush out of it or don't try to like rush God or make his decision for him. No, wait and see what God has to reveal for you. And finally, the last thing I learned is that God rewards the wait. Now, for uh, those of you who may know the story, but for those of you who don't, Joseph ends up out of prison, and by the end of it, he is put into a place of power. He's basically like second command of all Egypt. He is giving all these good things, all these blessings that God rewards him for his faith, but that's not really the reward that he probably really cared about. Those are all kind of like side blessings that were good things, and I promise you, blessings are a good thing. That's not what I'm saying, but the real reward through your whole time of waiting is a deeper faith and a deeper reliance on God. The real reward is a heart change. That's what's going to help you endure any future hard time in your life. Now, the blessings in your life, don't get me wrong, they're good, but they're nowhere near as good as knowing the God of the whole universe. That's going to be way better than anything you could ever have in this life. That is why you need a faith to endure the darkest times, because they will ultimately result in a deeper faith and a deep relationship with your Father in heaven. Your legacy will be built side by side with your enduring faith in the Lord. Period. Like that's always going to be how it happens. So now we're about to move into a time of communion. And in this period, in this time of uh, communion, I would really, if you're in a season of waiting and you're trying to do this whole waiting thing, if you're trying to endure all this hardship, if you're trying to do all this on your own and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'd invite you to not wait alone. Don't do that. Take a relationship with Jesus first. Talk to a leader. Talk to someone. And we would love to have that conversation Myself, Jeremiah, any leader in here would love to have a conversation about bringing you to a relationship with Jesus. We love that. But also for those in here who do know Jesus, who do, who do have a good relationship with him, maybe in your season of waiting and you forgot just how good his goodness is. Use this time of taking the Lord's Supper to remind yourself of the greatest good that was ever done on your behalf when he laid down his life so that you may find yours. But then also for those of you in here who may be not in a bad season, but you're, in a, you're, at a, you're on a hill. You're not in a valley, but you're on a hill. Well, use this time to still take the Lord's Supper and to remind yourself of a time that is so good in his presence, that's so good coming to his table and enjoying a meal with him to remind yourself when you do find yourself in hardship that, yeah, I remember the greatest thing ever done for me. I remember that my Savior rescued me from this or that. Remind yourself of that. So use this time of communion to really sit and think about that. So the band's going to play one last song for us. And during that song, come up and worship. But when you feel the need to go take communion, when you feel the need to go take the Lord's Supper, there's leaders uh, all in the back of the room that you can go find and take that meal. So right now, uh, I'm going to pray us into the song. And then you feel free to come worship up to the front of the stage. So Father, I humbly come for you now, Lord, just to thank you for this time. God, sometimes it seems like in the waiting or in the silence that we are lost, but it's just us, our unwavering faith. You are there by our side every step of the way. You have never abandoned us or left us behind. You are faithful even when we're not. God, I ask that during this time of uh, having a meal that represents what you've done for us, God, that it will truly take hold of every part of our heart. God, that we remember your goodness and what you've done for us even when we're not good. 
Father, I thank you for who you are and who you always continue to do for us, even when we're not doing enough, even when we feel like we're alone. God, you are there right by our side. God, stir our hearts to run to you and to never stop doing that. Let it be a life lesson for our, our whole entire lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.